Linus Tech Tips just published a new video building a $69 gaming computer out of an HP Z workstation. I don't know anybody else who's covered Z workstations as much as I have in their YouTube content. So I want to react to this. Let's check it out together. We just built a $69 gaming computer. <laughs> $69. PC. So and it's a Z420. 69420. You know, you know what he was going for there. <laughs> This is a part two. Uh, I'll have a link to both of his videos on this one down in the description below. This is the second part to it. They're upgrading it. This is where it becomes far more relevant for current usage instead of just a Mimi super cheap budget computer. What new feats of potency could it reach for $169, $269, or even $420? <laughs> you knew it was going there. It's <laughs> really fast our 30 dollar gtx 760 here will not be outdone in the bang for the buck department used to be a good budget yes, gpu can, not really anymore can play just about any game but if we want to do better than 720p at the lowest possible settings see what i mean this guy is going to be the first to go once our lawnmower business starts paying dividends back when we prepared this video rx 580 prices hadn't yet been annihilated by the Ethereum merge. So oh, yeah. I guess I wasted a hundred bucks on this thing. RX 580 is what I went with on the most recent video on this channel where we uh, analyzed the Z440 as a budget gaming option for under $300. So yeah, uh, and I think he does end up going with one of those. And I'm a good go choice for a budget GP right now. 1060 is good too. We went with this dual OC model from ASUS, but realistically you could go with just about any RX 580, as long as it's not one like this, where it's got both an eight pin, I would not recommend this. Yes, don't use SATA to GPU power adapters. Uh, most of the time, I guess Molex, you can get away with it. I have done one where it took uh, two six pins, uh, connectors like that, and I used a bunch of adapters and stuff. No issues, no issues. Maybe I'm taking a risk, but no issues. Toolless installation. And that's it. Oh yeah, for these budget builds, definitely going with a any GPU that has just a single power plug would be the best, no matter what. Just like what Linus is saying. But it does have dual six pins, but finding a GPU, a higher end one that's dual six pin, not so easy. It's usually six and eight. So <laughs> game in such a well-optimized game. I love I mean, it. Okay. Welcome back. If you're new around here, my name is Chris. This is Coalition Gaming, and I like to teach you guys about repairing, setting up, and streaming from your PC. If you're into that sort of thing, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any of our videos. Okay, right, let's go again. Where's the bad guys at? I'm only on the first level. It did the wrong guy! Ah! This is- See, I've actually benchmarked an RX 580 in Doom Eternal on high, not ultra. Did he go ultra? I forget. But I benchmarked it on high. No, he said high, which is like medium, right? So RX 580 benchmark on high with the Xeon E5-1620 4-core 8 thread, Sandy Bridge. And it did manage to get over 60 FPS most of the time, actually. Look at these performance graphs. I mean, yeah, we're spending nearly three... Now, he's showing 720p benchmarks, so that way they can pump the numbers. And that's cool and all, but... You, these are definitely 1080p budget gaming beasts. So, yeah, this makes the bars look faster, bigger, whatever, how you, however you want to put it. But they can do 1080p, so don't be alarmed by the use of 720p benchmarks in his video. They're good 1080p machines, especially with an RX 580 or GTX 1060, sort of as your minimum GPU. Times as much on the machine compared to where we started. But there are also cases you see? where we're getting you see? three times the performance. The point. What, what else do you have, Linus? What else? To us. The bad news is the locked down BIOS on our Z420 workstation does not support the next generation of Intel Xeon chips, codenamed Ivy Bridge. Okay, so here's an important point. The lockdown BIOS doesn't support uh, Ivy Bridge, even though he's on a Sandy Bridge platform. And in all other cases with motherboards, you've been able to just get Ivy Bridge support with a BIOS update. HP did something weird here because they use something called a boot block and the boot block, which is encrypted and you can't change it, uh, locks out any uh, Ivy Bridge upgrades. So you can buy a Z420 like he has here and if it comes with the sandy bridge cpu or you ask the ebay seller whether it has whether it had an ivy bridge or sandy bridge xeon in it if they say it had a sandy bridge xeon in it you can't use an ivy bridge xeon on it 
The Ivy Bridge Xeon systems have a different boot block, a newer boot block. Some of them show the bio screens on the uh, on the for sale pages on eBay, but uh, there was basically they use the boot block to separate out. So HP can come out with their Z420 in 20, let's say 2011, and then they can come out with the Z420 again in 2012 with uh, Ivy Bridge support. And that way they can sort of make more money by making you buy the new computer if you want to use the new CPU. That was basically what HP did with these ones. So you can find Ivy Bridge supporting uh, Z420 HPZ workstations on eBay. And if it's not stated outright what CPU it has in it, what CPU it used, or shows a picture in the BIOS with a boot block of, I believe, 2012 or newer, then just ask the seller which kind of Xeon this used. And if they say use the Xeon with a V2 designation, then you can use Ivy Bridge. And this is gonna play a factor for when he eventually does a CPU upgrade in the system, which is what he's gonna talk about right now, because uh, you want, uh, Ivy Bridge just had better Xeons than Sandy Bridge did. So cast off Sandy Bridge chips, even really high-end ones are cheap and plentiful. The most- He's right there powerful CPU supported by our motherboard then is the E52687W. Okay, here's a red flag already. The W designation is a higher TDP CPU. So most of these are gonna be 130 watt CPUs, more or less. The W designations are 150 watt um, or 155 watts, somewhere around there. And that's gonna necessitate the use of a different cooler or it's gonna want the BIOS to ask for a different cooler. So let's see what happens. Ah, see, that's the 1620 I have back there. His benchmarks were doing it the same on my test batch, my Z620 test batch back there. It's a good CPU, high clocks for four core eight, eight thread. I believe it's 3.6 gigahertz base with the four gigahertz turbo. The 2687W he's showing is an eight core 16 thread CPU, which is awesome. They're doing that before, the, uh, on, it's not really mainstream platform at the time, but eight core 16 thread and it took Ryzen uh, AMD until 2017 to come out with that but it took Intel until how long? 2019 maybe? Before they brought eight cores and 16 threads to the mainstream platform? <laughs> but uh, on the high-end platform, uh, they were doing that for a long time already. But it has double the number of cores, double the See? number of threads. There you go. And oh, 3.8, so, okay. Let me go back real quick on that one because it's important to note here. The, v the original Sandy Bridge Xeons genuinely have lower clocks than the V2 Ivy Bridge Xeons. This is one of the reasons you want an Ivy Bridge Xeon because they're just faster for the same skew. This is a 3.8 gigahertz turbo with the 3.1 gigahertz uh, base clock. Like I said, the 2687W V2 has a 3.4 gigahertz base and a four gigahertz turbo. So at, when you're at this level of budget, those little bits make a big difference. Double the number of threads and costs a mere $30 on eBay. Unfortunately, this CPU runs hot enough that HP figured- Oh, it here we go. Cooler instead of this thing. <laughs> so I guess we'll need to upgrade that too. We've talked a fair bit about how water coolers are not always better than air coolers. And this wimpy thing is a prime example. Meanwhile, the cool- Now, because he's sticking with the stock case, he should have got that wimpy HP AIO thing because then he would not have the issues he's gonna have. Going with a cooler like this one, which is what I have on my Z620 back there, it's perfectly fine. It'll work just fine. There are things with these Z workstations that require a little bit of uh, creativeness in order to be able to po post and boot without issue. Five to 10 for some thermal paste, and I'm expecting a pretty nice uplift for $50 here. I don't know about a rocket, face. but yeah. This is a See, five he's noticing it, he's noticing it. Oh man, I love HEDT. I love HEDT cooler installs. I absolutely agree i wish the mounting system from socket 2011 and 2011 v3 was the sockets the default socket system for everything maybe a, a intel wouldn't be even having the issues they're having with mounting pressure if they adopted this for every style because it's an integrated back plate and integrated screw mounts on the front all you do is you line it up and you put the screws in and you're done there's nothing there's nothing to it it's awesome uh, this is a four pin fan mm -hmm. industry standard Remember mm -hmm. on the motherboard, we had that five-pin fan header? Well, 
A quick Google search later, we find a post from user Silent Bogo on the Tech Power Up forums, who tells us that the yep. motherboard header is actually a four pin fan header, but just with two ground connectors, one on either side of the active pins. So our workaround is to take a four pin fan splitter and use that to make it work. Now, there is the same problem on the HP Z400 workstations, and you can just take that four pin PWM connector and put it on four pins of that CPU cooler header. Um, I'm not sure if it's the left four pins or the right four pins. I don't remember exactly, but it will work just fine if you do that. And uh, on the Z400s, I would just take that empty pin and take like a front panel cable, slide it over that pin and then ground it to the back of the case somewhere and then it bypasses whatever error that you would get. On the Z420 builds, for some reason, uh, because I didn't use, that's what it is, because I didn't use a high power W series CPU like what he's using for my Z420 builds, um, you didn't have that problem. You can just put the fan on there and then you don't have to worry about doing any hackery like this. Bad news is that this is not the only ridiculous error that could have you pressing F1 every time you want to boot your computer. The good news is that every single one of these errors has a solution that is both inexpensive and can be executed with standard household tools. But right. to show you how many things can cause these sorts of problems, let's go ahead and shut the system back off and unplug some stuff. Now, yeah, there are a lot of, the, the, the RAM fan is one. The RAM fan is the problem with transplanting Z620s. For, for some reason on the Z420, it didn't, I didn't have that issue, so. Weird. I think it just used a regular four pin PWM and that's why it was easier. But take out this one. There's some USBs that sure. also ask for a sense and, and front panel Oops, fans sorry. as well. Sorry, front panel fan, front fans. There you go. What is that? CPU card is a good cooling solution. That's because he's using the high, the high power W CPU. Memory fan not connected. That's because yeah, he unplugged that. Firewire has a sense pin as well. USB not connected. Yep, yep, yep. Front USB not connected specifically. To be clear, it's kind of a cool feature, actually. I guess. So I use a non W CPU, so I won't be getting that CPU requires liquid cooling solution error. Memory fan on the Z420s is just a four pin PWM, so you can plug the rear fan into that one and then you're solid there. The front 1394, who uses Firewire, go into the BIOS under security, you can just disable it and uh, then you won't have an error and then front usb connected there's a yellow usb header that just you just stick a jumper on the sense pin a full list of the fixes that i did in the description of that video as well okay, so well yes plug it all back, back in though slightly less powerful e52690 we probably could have avoided okay so e52690 is a 2.9 gigahertz base with a 3.8 gigahertz turbo I believe the E5 2667, uh, yeah, just that one, ARC, which is not the V2, but the regular, is also eight cores. It's a six core. On V2 Ivy Bridge, this one goes up to eight cores. So he picked a good one, 2690 Sandy Bridge one. Um, that's a good one that he should have gone with and they wouldn't have that. But that fifth pin thing, that just makes me think of the Z400 issue and he could have just taken a wire and grounded that pin and be done. And it, it wouldn't have had to do none of the hackery stuff. Just line up the four pin PWM to the four pins, ground out that wire and you're, you're, you're ready. Wait a second, wait a second. Okay, I thought my post was in there. I, that's one of the guides that I followed as well when I started my Z420 workstation stuff. Here comes front chassis fan. <laughs> I guess he forgot to plug that in, or there's a quick and easy solution. Here's this, here's where I have a little bit of a problem. Oh, so it costs yeah, forty dollars. Forty dollars for the front oh, case fan assembly. A special bracket for the fan. Just put everyone else. <laughs> Another <laughs> hack job. Yeah. From our work earlier. Uh, <laughs> So they're just tricking it. His fix is cool because it just tricks it just tricks the system. All you really need to do is plug in a PWM fan to the front chassis fan header. And then you're done. <laughs> Hooray! <laughs> yeah, I, I wish I wish that the team had found my video on it. But uh, you know, maybe they'll see this. <laughs> Tesla, Tesla trash talk. This is a problem that I was aware of when I was originally doing these things because uh, I would use the 92 millimeter coolers like from uh, the Gamax 300, deep cool Gamax 300 stuff, a little bit smaller, you wouldn't have this issue. Again, this is a, a research issue that uh, 
or I mean just eyeballing it. He could have got a con and grabbed a lower profile, less taller cooler or something like that. And he does. The well, let's see Thanks what happens next. There's a quick and easy. Solution. No, Linus. Speed holes. No. Off camera, we just put a little bit of like. I called them speed holes too. Or something <laughs> on the top of the heat pipes. Oh God. Let no, you should have done it the other. Ugh. Yeah. You know what? He thinks he's gonna be fine. <laughs> thinks he's gonna be fine. Friends, and immediately hurts himself on Apparently. it. Free Quad channel. Oh, yeah, off of eBay. CC DDR3 for about 30 bucks. It's cheap. Server RAM on eBay is cheap. Even DDR4 is cheap. The, the, the Z440 workstation I talked about in my latest video, it was cheap stuff too. <laughs> And that's DDR4 again, so it's like next next one up from this one is a Haswell, so far more modern than Ivy Bridge. A two and a half gig network See, card. this is totally oh, unnecessary for this kind of build, though. Yeah, totally unnecessary for your average gamer and your average user, but if you put this in a more work, workstation-like environment, and you're going to be using it for gaming and, say, video editing and things like that, then, yeah, actually, that's a pretty good choice. Especially because the PCIe slots in these builds are how they should be and that they're open-ended. And, uh, well, that matters more for GPUs because they have the full 16x thing. And you can stick a 16x one into a 4x slot. Think, think about what I just said. You can, this one, you can stick a 16x GPU in pretty much any of the PCIe slots because they're open-ended. That's what the standard was all about in the, in the past. But Xeons have a lot more PCIe lanes than your mainstream consumer CPUs. So you can get away with adding capture cards, uh, two and a half gigabit LAN cards, Wi-Fi cards, whatever you want, and you're not gonna have a problem. Lack of lanes, because they have, I believe, 40 PCIe lanes instead of 16. It's a big deal. And this was all the way from what, 2014, 2013. With our eight core CPU, they are significantly more consistent. This is what I love about multi-core really CPUs. It's making the game feel going, a lot more going dark. over four cores into a six core and eight core territory, I feel like it always helps keep your minimums better. It may not necessarily be higher performance, but smoother gameplay. And that means a lot. You know, smoother than oh. the FPS counter would indicate. That's awesome. For 100 FPS. This is what I'm talking and about. Play, the game is running pretty I mean, high. Admittedly, the game so came out around the time that this FPS. kind of system yes, was in mainstream same, use, so. Like, performance for 1080p gaming in pretty much any game you There we go. Yes, absolutely. $69. Absolutely amazing for the price. What do you got on the table there, Linus? But I want more. More what? Oh, of course you do. Well, $23 <laughs> to patiently wait for a one terabyte hard drive to show up somewhere. One terabyte <laughs> SSD. Let's get that straight. The smart choice is probably a yeah. 512 gig or one terabyte, two and a half inch SSD, $85. For there you go. Uh, let's be clear here on something. DRAM cache and a SATA SSD, you need it. On an NVMe SSD, less important. This amount of spare cash has me not really thinking straight. <laughs> I'm thinking high speed NVMe drive. The problem with NVMe drives on these systems, only some Haswell motherboards and they're, and we're talking enthusiast motherboards supported booting off of NVMe. These systems, these workstations definitely couldn't boot off of an NVMe SSD. And so that's the reason I would generally just suggest just stick with the SATA SSD. However, in Windows, yeah, they can recognize a, an, an NVMe SSD off of a PCIe adapter, and then you can make that your game drive if you really wanted the, the speed. Not necessary, though. SATA is plenty fast for gaming off of, but uh, let's see what he does. PCI Express slot to dun, 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 an M.2 slot. And there are cheap, and the cheap ways to do this, too. ...is because they're not actually really doing anything. Terabyte. That cost us 100 and... Whoop, and he 120 dropped it. Canadian <laughs> See that? There isn't even a sub menu in the bio. Oh, oh no. No, okay, okay, we have an even more of a problem here with how he's configured his system. <laughs> SATA mode is an IDE. So it's in it's in an emulation mode that's an older style and admittedly can have some performance loss to some degree. Honestly, not that big a deal. But um, you can just stick SATA mode into SATA. So he's running the, the two and a half inch SATA SSD that's been in the system in IDE mode, which is not good. Run it in SATA mode, you'll be fine. Or HCI is what it really is. For NVMe drives, 
but that doesn't mean that the system can't see it. It's the first thing I check when I do these systems. Yep, just like I said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, these systems very much resembled uh, the Mac Pros of the day, which used the same platform for Xeons. And you could just buy one of these systems off the shelf and Hackintosh it to run Mac and have yourself an incredibly affordable Mac Pro off of the Z workstations. We're going to put the Clover bootloader on it and allow our system to boot from the fly. See, I think this is pretty cool because there's not a solution I would have thought of. Between our system. And this is why I like watching this content. This is actually, it reminds me of something from my work. Okay, you have a sort of in between in order to get the uh, system to boot off of a, 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 I guess, a different kind of drive. I've run into situations at work where uh, we installed a UEFI OS uh, and a, the computer was still in legacy mode and we didn't know it and uh, it would only work if our network cable was plugged in and it booted into a, a sort of Pixie PXE network boot loader before then just moving on from there into the UEFI SS uh, installation. And that was fine. And uh, But then as soon as you unplug the ethernet cable and it no longer can boot to Pixie and it just skips that step, failed to boot, can't even see it. So this caused a lot of problems for us when everything was moving into UEFI, but it's in the past now. And this reminds me of a fix like that which I think is pretty cool. Plug our drive into one of the many open USB 2 headers on our motherboard. Which, which is cool. These workstations actually had a lot of uh, uh, USB headers in them. So you would you'd be able to do this and still have your normal front panel uh, USB connectors. You're not really cannibalizing anything in order to get this functionality. This is immediately noticeably faster. Well, you, you, you had your SSD in IDE mode. Of course, it's gonna feel faster now. <laughs> We're back in game now. The performance is very similar to what we had before, but that you see my point. You can be on an NVMe SSD, or you can be on a SATA SSD, whether it's an IDE or HCI mode. Your games are still going to play more or less the same. Maybe load a little bit faster. Boom! I alt tab out. I'm doing stuff. I'm Multitasking computer, for sure. I alt, but we're not done yet. We promised you guys. Oh, oh, not done yet. What's next, Linus? I was told I was getting $50 oh, gee, in RGB geez. lighting. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I guess that's fair <laughs> enough. At this budget, that would be a pretty stupid thing to spend another $50 on. Actually, if you had $50 left in the budget and the GPU was, what, 80 ish dollars, that puts you right into GTX 1070 territory on eBay and the used market in general, which is a massive performance uplift over an RX 580 or GTX 1060. So, yes, put the money into a better GPU. They're not that far off in order to do on a budget. 37, 35 mm. FPS? Oh, it's not perfect. Average around 43 FPS. That's about the same results I got in the Cyberpunk benchmark with the RX 580 that I ran with the Xeon E5 1620. Hmm? But there is no question whatsoever that this is playable. It does uh, make sense that, uh, you know, if you can play Cyberpunk, you can pretty much play anything. I guess maybe Elden Ring would be one to test out. This was an awesome video, and I'm glad to see Linus spotlighting the old workstation meta that i've been following since 2016 the very beginnings of this youtube channel and uh, i love to see it i hope that they follow up with the part three and that they transplant this system that he's now hacked up with drill holes and stuff into a better looking system because it is the next step if you've upgraded this system to now where you can play all your games and anything you want then what do you do after that that's left to upgrade you make it prettier and so that requires a transplant and i know what you need to do in order to get this transplanted well i'll leave the link down in the description below to my video again that i've mentioned that also has the list of what i did in the description of that video but linus if you guys see this if you guys watch this and anybody else seeing this right now tag them tweet at them let them know i want to help i want to help make his computer something even nicer for, for everybody watching who likes this but wasn't a fan of the looks or the hacks that he did. <laughs>
with that said if you like this video you know what to do hit that subscribe button and that bell so you don't miss a single upload also i stream to twitch every friday at 8 p.m pacific at twitch.tv slash coalition gaming crew so if you want to come by and talk hpz workstation uh, budget b budget builds and transplants and tech like that that's the place to be come and say hi drop a follow and let's talk i got all the videos linked right over there and down in the description below of all the Xeon stuff that I, I mean, I'll make a playlist for you guys if you want to check out all the Z workstation and, and a lot of the Xeon content that I've done over the years. So make sure you check that out. I'll see you in the comments over there. That does it for this video. Peace out for now. Bye.